Good morning, friends. Welcome to worship. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you're welcome into this beginning of Holy Week worship, this Palm Sunday, where we celebrate that Christ is coming to save us. Hosanna, save us, O Holy One. As our exploration of the gifts of the dark wood begin to come to a close, we look around us to acknowledge the kingdom, the family that has always and is already right here with us. Sojourners in the dark wood do not go it alone, but are blessed with the presence of others who see and reflect with us and discover together with us the riches of a life lived with intention. As Jesus comes into Jerusalem at the beginning of that fateful week, he is surrounded by those who will live in the uncertainty, the temptation, and the emptiness right alongside him. Friends, please join me in this Palm Sunday prayer of confession. For hesitating to join the parade of life with our whole selves, forgive and restore us, O God. For letting fear keep us from walking alongside our neighbors, forgive and restore us, O God. For shying away from struggle, even when we know what is right. Forgive and restore us, O God. The 
Beloved, hear these words of assurance. God continues to invite us to this parade. It is never too late. God asks us to be companions, and we can. It is never too late. God is with you, forgiving and restoring you to wholeheartedness. Thanks be to God. Amen. Friends, here at the end of Lent, I have one last bucket-filling book for you. This is the book called The Best Bucket Filler Ever, God's Plan for Your Happiness. And we have permission from the bucket fillers to share this with you. From the beginning of time, God created everything. God created the heavens and the earth, day and night, water and land, plants and trees, the sun, moon and stars, all fish, birds and animals, every living thing. God created every person who ever lived and God created you. Every single person is loved by God. Before you were born, God breathed into a small invisible bucket that was made a part of you and filled it with love and light. God was your first bucket filler and you were happy. Every day and everywhere, in many ways, God fills buckets with love and light. God wants every bucket filled and every person happy. God created you to be a bucket filler too, someone who treats everyone with love and kindness. You can fill buckets because God first filled yours. Filling buckets is like planting seeds in a garden. God grows each seed that you plant. The tiny seeds of love and kindness you plant will blossom into a harvest of happiness for you and many others. God wants you to fill your own bucket, to make your friends, to work together, to rest, play, laugh, learn, love. God wants you to discover and enjoy your God-given talents and the wonderful world God created for you. Because God is always with you, you can talk to God anytime, anywhere, about anything. You can thank God. You can say you're sorry. You can ask God for help. God always hears and cares and wants the best for you. God loves you. God loves everyone. Now, many people don't know God loves them, and theirs may, there may be an emptiness in their bucket. Many people feel lonely and sad because they don't know how special they are or how to fill their buckets. What if everyone everywhere knew how much God loved them and that they were created in God's image to be bucket fillers? What if everyone learned to fill buckets? People everywhere would be happy. They would learn to love God, love others, and love themselves. They would do their best to treat everyone with the same kindness and respect they would like to receive. People everywhere would use their time and talents to fill buckets. They would look for ways to help and do good and fill their own buckets too. People everywhere would work together to create a circle of love and light, peace, joy, friendship, and kindness that includes everyone. People everywhere would know who to thank when they see a meadow of flowers, a glowing sunset, a starlit sky, or other beauty. God, the creator, is filling their buckets. And as you follow God's plan, you will travel merrily on the road of happiness, lined with all the buckets you fill. That's because God is your best bucket filler ever, and you are a bucket filler too. So friends, I, I hope you've taken some time to reflect upon your bucket. Um, for some of our youngest friends, we gave you a bucket. Some of our uh, youth received these uh, jars and if you would like to, you can look at, at how to fill that, that bank of kindness or these buckets with, with some donations that we would like to, to send to give blankets to be a, a symbol of that love and kindness that goes from you to someone in need. And if you'd like to, now's the time to, to finish up uh, filling your bucket or your bank and send those donations in. For our older friends, if you'd like to make a donation of, of $10, that provides a blanket to someone in need. You can do that on our church website or add that to your offering. And we believe that these uh, tangible symbols of love and warmth will, will be one of those ways that we can share God's loving kindness with each and with all. Thank you. God bless you.
Our scripture reading is from the Gospel according to Luke. When he had come near Bethage and Bethany at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Just say this, the Lord needs it. So those who were sent departed and found it as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, the owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They said, the Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus. And after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. As he rode along, People kept throwing their cloaks on the road as he was now approaching the path of the Mount of Olives. The whole multitude of disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. As he came near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, If you, even you, had only recognized on this day the things that make for peace. Journeying Jesus, enter our lives and open us to the gifts residing deep in the holy darkness of our lives. Help us to be with and for each other as the crowds that day offered their presence to you. In your holy name we pray, amen. The story of Palm Sunday is featured in all four Gospels. The story of Jesus entering into Jerusalem, the story with the humble beasts, the shouting of the crowds, the palm branches, the coats, the cloaks spread out like a carpet upon the road. This story has center stage in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now making the cut in all four Gospels, well, that is a big biblical deal. Christmas didn't make it in all four Gospels. Two of the Gospels make no mention of the pregnant Mary for whom there is no room in the inn, or the shepherds watching their flocks by night, or the angels, or the star, or the magi, or the baby in the manger. Christmas only makes the cut in two of the Gospels. The Lord's Prayer didn't make it in all four Gospels. The prayer that Jesus taught his followers, the prayer that the church has recited over the course of the past two millennia, the prayer recited in Kenyan huts and European basilicas, recited by Catholic and Orthodox and Protestant and Pentecostal, Jesus' own prayer is not in all four Gospels. It only made the cut in two the parable of the Good Samaritan, the parable of the prodigal son appear in but one gospel. The Beatitudes, as part of the Sermon on the Mount or the Sermon on the Plain, make it in only two of the gospels. But the Palm Sunday story, the story of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, this story has pride of place in all four gospels. Which makes me wonder if we have had something wrong all along. All along, Christians have regarded Pentecost as the birthday of the church. The church's birthday, the day that the church was born with wind and fire. 
But after I read a reflection by one of our UCC pastors who shared a, a wonderful, compelling sermon, it makes me reconsider. It makes me wonder, what if today, Palm Sunday, is truly the birthday of the church? Palm Sunday is the day that the followers of Jesus grew up, found their voices, summoned their courage, and assumed their role as witnesses to God's own will on earth as it is in heaven. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day. Palm Sunday is the day that the followers of Jesus stepped out onto the world stage, stepped out as witnesses for the realm of God. So let me set the scene. So first of all, there's no pandemic. I imagine the ancient city of Jerusalem during the annual Passover would be like a world's fair or an international festival. The city would swell with all of the visitors from all over the world. The city is alive, a buzz international and exciting. Every possible room is rented at a premium price. Grocers have stocked their shelves to capacity. Everyone is out of doors. The visitors and the pilgrims are readily identifiable by their clothing and their manners or their extra bags hanging off of their shoulders by the way that they meander up and down the streets, pausing, gazing, pointing, Merchants sell their wares, exotic foods and trinkets and brightly colored cloth on the street corners and in the public squares. Musicians and street performers gather knots of people who gape and laugh and applaud. The atmosphere sizzles and pulses. The whole exotic world has come to Jerusalem. Expectation is in the air. To keep the peace, Roman legions compelled into military service, helmeted, armor gleaming, astride on noble steeds, they patrol the streets. Until this day, until this moment, until right now, the followers of Jesus have been just that, followers, largely passive and reflective. They have wandered behind Jesus all over Palestine. When he argued with civil and religious officials, they, they watched, tense and riveted. When he defended a prostitute, they gasped. When he conversed in public with a woman from Samaria, they winced. When he conversed and with those scholars and religious authorities, when he defied Sabbath law, they cringed. When he declared that the last shall be first and the first last and the rich poor, they glanced around guardedly to see who was listening. When he kissed lepers and healed those of broken bodies, they whispered in fascinated awe. Until this day, this moment, until right now, the followers of Jesus had been just that, followers, largely passive, keen observers. But on Palm Sunday, Today, a shift occurs, a transformation begins, and it's seismic. As they enter Jerusalem, the followers begin to assume roles of leaders. They walk out onto the stage, onto the world stage of a capital city during a great annual festival. For the first time that they have known Jesus, they take up their roles as co-creators in the kingdom of God. As Jesus and his paltry band of followers enter the city, the Roman soldiers gather to investigate the fuss. The war horses are snorting, their armor gleaming, swords flashing with this crest bearing Caesar's proud and commanding image. Against this display of power and authority, against and in defiance of it, the followers of Jesus stage a street theater drama announcing that their hearts and their allegiance belong not to Caesar, not to the emperor of Rome, no, not to that pretend God, but to Jesus, the Prince of Peace, the 
Son of God. On the streets of Jerusalem and in front of God and Rome and everybody, they announce and they proclaim that their hearts and allegiance belong not to the Pax Romana, an uneasy peace achieved by force, but to the Pax Christi, a peace to which they were invited but never coerced, a peace which emanates from the very heart of God, a peace that passes all understanding. This is the day that they shout in public that they belong to God, not to Caesar, which in their case, on this day, is nothing less than an act of sedition. For the past three years, from the day that they called Jesus, that Jesus called them from their fishing nets until this moment, their commitment to follow Jesus, well, it had been personal. It had been intimate. It had been private. But today, this day, on Palm Sunday, their commitment to follow Jesus has become public and it becomes political. Palm Sunday has a proud of place in all four Gospels because this day, the followers of Jesus Christ become protagonists. They become actors and leaders, players and participants in the kingdom of God. This is the day that the church comes out of the closet. This is the day that the church distances itself from the state and all other worldly power. This is the day, this is the moment, this hour, that they absolutely and entirely renounce and repudiate all allegiance and fidelity to every other earthly leader and sovereign, and they vow that they do and they will bear true faith and true allegiance to Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, the Son of God. This is the day that the church becomes the church. This is the day that the church is born. This is the day we say to Jesus, it's our turn. You have taught us well. You have shown us and you have taught us what God looks like. Thank you, Jesus. We have been your followers, but it's time for us to be witnesses, for us to testify. It's our turn now. It's our turn to show the world what God looks like, to show to the world what love looks like, to show to the world what it looks like to love in the way that you love Jesus, to love the least like the greatest, to show the world what it looks like to forgive those who trespass against you, to forgive the one who sin against you, to show the world what it looks like to, to catch a glimpse of and to become co-creators of the kingdom of heaven here on earth. In a world that is often violent and vicious, it's our turn to show the world, to show our friends, our families, our neighbors, our colleagues, what it looks like to follow the Prince of Peace, to turn the other cheek. It's our turn now. In a merciless world, a dog-eat-dog, -dog, might-makes-right world, it's our turn to show the world what mercy looks like what God's mercy looks like. It's our turn now today to give witness to mercy. For Christ's sake, we witness to God's amazing grace to show the world what God looks like and, and watch. Just watch the world turned upside down. It won't be easy. It will be costly. But thankfully, none of us makes this journey alone. Up to this point in our Lenten journey, our reflections on this dark wood, we've been considering the quest for our life's path, primarily from our own perspective as individuals. It is only as individuals that we awaken and find ourselves in the dark wood, and each of us must find our own distinctive path through it. Yet given the difficulties and challenges that we encounter in the dark wood, walking alone is about as advisable as walking alone in a physically dark world. It's very easy to get lost without the aid of our companions. And it is often through them that we receive our clearest glimpses of heaven. 
Now our author of the Gifts of the Dark Wood calls this blessing the gift of misfits. And you might not like that word, misfit, but what the author intends is to describe someone who is being as intentional as you are about embracing these gifts of the dark wood and finding their place in the world, if not more so. Now, these are comparatively rare individuals and therefore powerful companions, mentors, friends. They are truly gifts on the journey, like the gift of our community of faith, the gift of the church. It was on Palm Sunday that the followers of Jesus Christ began to understand how costly and rigorous is the Christian life. You have to train for it the way an athlete trains for a race, rehearsing virtues, practicing courage, training oneself in kindness, exercising gentleness, working at mercy and generosity. It's a full-time job, this training and practicing. It is a way of life. Perhaps the Palm Sunday story has pride of place in all four Gospels because it was on Palm Sunday, it was today, that the church was truly born, not in wind or fire, but with courage and in conviction. This is the day that the church found its feet and found its voice and swore allegiance to the Prince of Peace. May the church be born again today, reborn today on Palm Sunday in me and in you. For Christ's sake, let us show the world what God looks like. Amen. Friends, this is Holy Week. Our extra worship services on Monday, Thursday and Good Friday will both be at 7.30 and will be available online. We have our Monday, Thursday service pre-recorded here 
in our Ivanhoe Sanctuary, you will be invited to participate in Holy Communion. If you could find and prepare for yourself some bread and juice. Our Good Friday service will be live streamed from Community Protestant Church in Mundelein. Again, those are both at 7.30 p.m. Then on Easter Sunday, you're invited to come be in person outside for our Easter sunrise service at 6.30 a.m. And then we will have our uh, pre-recorded online service available uh, to celebrate at home. Thinking about this uh, theme, about the gift of misfits, our friends, our mentors, our companions along the journey, had we been together, I think I would have given you a, a blank thank you note. And I'm wondering if you might have one at home and you might be thinking about someone who has been part of our community, perhaps in your personal faith journey, someone who has been with you and helped you through the dark wood of your life and your faith journey. I'd invite you to, to send a thank you note and to give thanks for those who have been your companions along the journey. Friends, as we turn to prayer, I'd like to ask for your prayers for uh, Diane Thompson, who is beginning treatment for cancer, and also for Marie Gilbert's mother, Josette Jacoby. Uh, she was diagnosed with early stage breast cancer. She's having surgery on April 1st. Like your prayers for both of them and for all those who are, uh, have been affected here by this pandemic, with thanks for all those who are receiving their vaccines. Let us go to God in prayer by beginning with song. Come and rest. Come and rest. Come and listen. Come and listen. Lay the fullness of your lives before the Maker. Come and rest. Come and listen. Lay the fullness of your lives before the Maker. Beloved, we are entering the final week of Lent, and it has been a long journey through the dark wood, but we still have this week to go before the joy and celebration one week from today. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, we're very familiar with the stories of the crowd shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna. But we have to remember and understand what those people meant and what the Bible general always means in the Hebrew Bible, what Hosanna means. And it means, Lord, save us, help us. So when the people are crying Hosanna, it's with hope. But what they're crying is save us, help me, save us, help me. And that's where we are in our Lenten journey. We see Christ coming. We know because we have read the Bible. We know what this week means and what's ahead. And in this moment, we should be crying with our hearts, save us, help us. And in that spirit, we're going to go into our pastoral prayer now. And during the prayer, I will invite everyone to lift up their own prayers in silence. Friends, let us pray. Gracious God, with gratefulness in our hearts, we come to worship. We come to be the church with all of its goodness and all of its flaws. We come to worship with honesty in our words and in our hearts, leaving all pretenses behind. We come to treat our neighbors with respect while preparing to do the same when we leave these doors. We come to show you our wounds, our joyfulness, and all of our burdens and sorrows that we carry within us and ask you to fill us with what we need. 
Be the energy that guides our steps, the love that moves our hands, the heart that nurtures our loving action in this world. Hear us, O God. We remember the example of Jesus, gracious creator, as we remember who we are. He was the Son of God, who went through the darkest week of all and took what came. For in the end, joy was brought forth. Be with us, loving Creator, when our situations do the same due to circumstances beyond our control. Guide us through these dark woods, through these darkest times, and take hold of whatever situation we are in, all the ups and the downs. Utilize it for our growth to grow closer to you, to our neighbors, and to better understanding ourselves and who we are. We know you do not promise us peace and security in this complicated, difficult world, but you are with us every step of the way to love us. And now, loving God, we're going to lift up prayers to you in silence. Gracious God, we pray all these things in the name of the one who shows us faithfulness this week and every week. And we pray as your son Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. What you have done for us is marvelous, gracious God. Our gifts can never match your goodness toward us. Your saving grace, your healing light, your personal sacrifice are so far beyond our imagining. We can only offer ourselves all we have and all we are in response to the coming of Christ Jesus. Hosanna in the highest. Receive, O God, our humble service. Amen.
Fellow travelers, we have come through the six weeks of Lent, recognizing the gifts that can come to us anytime we find ourselves in the dark wood. Uncertainty can help us let go of the fear of the unknown. Emptiness can leave room for new possibilities. Thunderstruck moments can offer us insight. Getting lost can heighten our awareness. Temptation can help us know our true path. And reaching out to other misfits on the journey enriches our experience of life and love. Today, we begin a descent deeper into those woods as we move into the holiest of times, remembering how Jesus himself walked the way of frustration and anger, despair and betrayal, all because of his passion for the liberation of all people. The last gift of the dark wood is the gift of disappearing. This gift comes when we disappear for a while into a thin place where the human and divine seem particularly close. That indeed is the experience of Holy Week. I invite you to journey with us this Thursday night, the beginning of what we call these the tritium, meaning the three days where the dark wood was especially deep in the life of Jesus. Jesus has been there in the dark wood of life and is with us as well. Let this moment carry us into a time between a liminal place where all is possible through the presence of God. Friends, you have a place in this world, a place where everything comes together in your body and you disappear into the seamless whole. Get over any sense of separation of God and inhabit this world with your fullest self. May the spirit of the living God, made known to us most fully in life's deep wood, go before you to show you the way, go above you to watch over you, go behind you to push you into places you may not necessarily go yourself. Go beneath you to uphold and uplift you. Go beside you to be your strong and constant companion. And dwell within you to remind you that you most surely are not alone and remind you that you are loved. Love beyond your wildest imagination. May the fire of God's blessing burn brightly upon you and within you. 
now and always. Amen.